Hi, my name is Ashley Cowden. I'm the EL TOSA for the Morgan Hill Unified School District. And I'm here to talk to you a little bit about how we adapted our CM model to this virtual realm we find ourselves in. So Morgan Hill Unified did all virtual academies to train their new teachers in CM. The transition was fairly smooth, uh, other than a little bit of some tech hiccups. We did really great transitioning the whole group into a virtual model. Uh, the online learning center was easy to use once we you know, went through how to find it and where to locate the assignments, it went really well. Uh, teachers were able to complete their assignments and then even collaborate with each other as they were planning in breakout rooms and um, on site for a couple of our teachers as well. We used our, uh, the overview to help guide the Institute, which helped make it really smooth. We also added links and resources to our uh, virtual guide so that teachers were able to have a resource to look back on. We got great feedback from our participants. A lot of them really enjoyed the uh, virtual feel of it, even though we weren't able to be together in person. They got a lot out of it. They appreciated the presenter's time and our presenters were great at adapting the material. Our next steps, a lot of our teachers pulled out things like stu structured student talk, um, backwards design in their lesson planning that they're going to bring forward into their lessons to help create a more um, language centered focus to their lesson planning in the classroom, which is great. We also step, took it a step further this year. The Morgan Hill Unified TOSAs within the district created a badging institute for all things technology. A lot of our badges are Google Suite based and um, different programs that we've used within the district. But one of our gems was creating CM badges. And so our anybody who was trained in CM had the opportunity to go submit their work to the TOSA team and then earn a virtual badge to show off their work. We had a great time with CM this year. And although we missed the in-person part, we really did have a smooth transition to the virtual institute and it still provided a great experience for our participants and gave them enough information and motivation to take CM into their classrooms. Thank you. Hi everyone, my name is Frankie Kellett. I am an English teacher and a Constructing Meaning School Lead for Morgan Hill Unified School District. And uh, the topic that I'm gonna be talking about is long-term implementation of Constructing Meaning. So after the CM Institute, what comes next? Um, and I just wanted to let you know that you can contact me at my email address here. And if you'd like to access this Google Slides, you can go ahead and use this tiny URL to do so. So after I was trained around six years ago in CM and I started implementing uh, the CM skills, I started thinking about, okay, what support is there for me now that I've been trained and how can I remind myself to keep using these skills? Um, and so that kind of um, made a couple of us start thinking, what do we do once teachers are trained and how can we help teachers and support them in continuing with the implementation of CM? So our school and our district came up with a particular structure that we think um, is helping us to continue implementing CM. Uh, we wanted to create a system that helped to grow implementation even beyond the initial institute training that teachers went to. We wanted to give teachers uh, space to remember their training, discuss their training with other teachers and to figure out how to use that training and to continue um, incorporating it more and more into their curriculum, into their everyday uh, classroom time. And we also uh, realized that we have some teachers who maybe are not trained or who are new, who might need some context because they don't know what constructing meaning is. Um, but these skills are still helpful for them even if they haven't had the opportunity to go to the Institute yet. So we wanna also kind of balance out providing a space for more experienced teachers to continue honing their skills and also providing context and strategies for teachers who maybe have not been exposed to constructing meaning. So we came up with two different leadership roles for our school. The first leadership role is the school constructing meaning lead and it's funded by our district because um, the school CM lead also helps with district-wide training. So they help to 
uh, provide support at the Institute training, which is a district-wide initiative. Um, but at the school level, we also create and lead what we call refresher meetings. So once a quarter, we will have a refresher meeting. Um, it's incorporated into our PLC time, our collaboration time that our school already has in place. And it provides just a quick refresher about a particular CM skill and allows teachers to kind of discuss it and then check in on the rubric to see where they are and, and what they wanna do moving forward. And the school CM lead creates this, uh, leads that refresher meeti meeting and also meets with leaders from each department in order to help those department leads present the refresher meetings to their departments. So in addition to a school-wide lead, we have a department constructing meeting lead, which is funded by our school. And this department lead listens to the refresher that the school lead creates and kind of participates in it in a, a smaller meeting of just department leads and school leads. And then they take the refresher after it's been revised and discussed and they present that refresher to their department. And then once their department has received the refresher, they continue to support teachers in the implementation and answer any questions that teachers have. So here's kind of an idea of what a refresher looks like. We usually try to fit our refreshers into 30 minutes. Our collaboration time is an hour long. Um, 30 minutes is not usually enough time, but it's better than not having a refresher at all. So my goal is for us to have an hour at some point to have these refreshers. So we spent about five minutes reminding our department members what CM is and why CM matters so much. Um, and sometimes this will be just a brief statement. Other times it'll be a discussion where we're getting input from teachers who've had a lot of experience with CM. Secondly, we focus on just one ROP skill, one refining our practice skill. Um, and usually what we'll do is we'll look at where we are in the semester. So for example, um, if we're getting close to the end of the semester where there are lots of big projects coming up, we will discuss rubrics because we know that students are able to um, have a clear understanding of what's expected of them on projects and essays and research papers if they have a rubric that they're looking at and teachers are able to provide stronger feedback when they have a rubric. So um, if it's the end of the semester, we might focus on rubrics. Uh, if it's the beginning of the semester, we might focus on note taking and note making um, or reading skills. So we spent about five minutes kind of just quickly going over the skill, reminding people of what it is. And then we provide any resources that are created by EL Achieve, our district, our department, or any teachers who might have created resources. So we do this pretty quickly so that we can give teachers the chance to talk about the skills in small groups. So we break uh, up into about groups of two to three people and give teachers usually a couple of discussion questions to talk about the skill. How are they using it in their classroom? Why is the skill important for students? Um, and giving teachers who are maybe untrained or new the chance to ask questions as well and just kind of share what is working for them in their classrooms or what are they wanting to do in their classrooms that they haven't had the chance to do yet. And then finally, um, we, we come back, we have a one minute summary from each group really quickly, and we debrief by giving teachers the uh, rubric for the particular ROP skill that we've been working on for the day. And we usually give them a way to reflect on that skill, where they are with it, according to the rubric, and a way for them to provide feedback on how the refresher went so that we could use that for the next time that we have a refresher. Um, and on this slide, there are a couple of different links to different resources that we have at our district if you're interested in checking those out. So like I said earlier, we have one refresher per quarter. So I just wanted to give you an idea of uh, what our timeline is as leaders on campus of CM uh, for an academic quarter. So if we were looking at the last quarter, which is what I'm doing right now, we start in March with the school or district leads. They meet, they think about, okay, what are we doing right now in the school year? What's any previous feedback we've received from the last quarter? And we decide on which uh, ROP skill to focus on. And then we draft a presentation that will be given to the department leads, which will then be given to all teachers in all departments. Um, and then we will meet about a week ahead of time with just the department leads, and we will actually present the refresher to them uh, and have them participate in it, just like 
all teachers would. And then we talk about what could we add to this refresher? What should we revise? What's confusing? Uh, and we try to really refine the refresher so that they feel comfortable presenting it to their department. And we also give them the opportunity to take the refresher and change it up to make it more appropriate for their department, for their teachers. Then a week later, the department leads present the refreshers to their departments. And usually this is happening during our designated collaboration time that's already in our contract hours. And then finally, in uh, the time that follows that refresher meeting before the next quarter, uh, the school and the department leads monitor the feedback that uh, was collected in that Google form during the refresher and make sure that they meet individually with any teachers who request more support. So that is what we are doing uh, in Morgan Hill at Sobrato. Uh, a real quick summary, I do have some example refreshers. If you're interested in checking those out, you can click on the links. Um, and thank you for watching the presentation. Please feel free to reach out if you have any questions. Hi, fellow CM practitioners. My name is Dana Reginato. I'm a fourth grade teacher in the San Martin um, Gwen Environmental Science Academy in the Morgan Hill Unified School District. Uh, I work in a program called DEME, which is our dual immersion program. This year, I was blessed with a small class. I had 23 students during distance learning, and uh, nine of those students are classified as English learners, and two are reclassified students um, if English fluent as of this year or the previous year. Today, I'm gonna to lead you through a reflection on the use of drafting templates during distance learning. And I'm gonna especially focus on the ones that I did in English um, and some things that I tried to modify. Now, I just wanna give you this straight out. If you're looking for perfection or something, a model that, um, uh, yeah, perfect model. This is not it. But what you're going to see is reality. What a, a teacher who's trying to implement the, the constructing meaning principles, especially in the use of drafting templates, has done this year. And hopefully um, you can relate to this or you will get some insights as well on your own practice as we I'm going through it. So as you know, this is uh, the drafting template uh, model, and this is one that we use in our training from federal laws and state laws. What is the difference? We have a, co a column on the left that has um, it, the writing move, then the language support, which are those flexible, uh, portable language patterns, and then a space on the right for drafting. So again, my purpose for this is to reflect on the implementation of drafting templates, to think about what worked, what needs improvement, and what did I learn in the process? So in these two quarters um, that we've had in distance learning, um, I did two different writing assignments using drafted templates in the fall and two in the winter. One was called My Name Essay um, and Clues about California Natural Regions. In the winter, we did a opinion essay about GMOs and then we also did missions reports. And these links are here, um, but I've decided today to focus on the My Name essay and the missions report templates. Now to give you a little bit of background about the My Name essay assignment, um, the kids did a survey with their parents about why they chose their name. Um, we've also, we also had, um, they had a uh, reference to sources to use, to look up different information about their name and note-taking page, which had categories such as the meaning, the origin, the popularity, and other facts about their names. We read the book, The Name Jar, and my name is Maria Isabel, um, just as background knowledge and also to give them a segue to literature um, in, their, in their writing and just uh, in general, about how kids deal with different issues regarding their name and how their name um, is perceived by others. And so here I have a, a sample of writing from WR, um, how I got my name. He is a level three English learner, which could be on the road to reclassification. He's reading at grade level. And we have SR, who is a level two EL. Again, that may not be accurate because we um, haven't gotten the results yet from the shares. Uh, 
but he this year's uh, evaluations, but he um, is somewhere between two or three. He's just slightly below low grade level in reading, and Nat- and it, Natalie in our level two EL also. Um, I also have TS her uh, final draft and draft. So the the interesting thing that you should note is that all of my language learners skipped writing on the drafting template. It says drafting, but it should say drafting there template. And only and two of them tried to cut and paste the drafting template um, into another document. And now it's that's interesting because um, all of my students that were Louis classified are not language learners use the drafting template as intended. So just the nature of the drafting template itself or the way it was introduced is called into question here for comprehension for my language learners. But let's see what it looked like when I tried cutting and pasting it. I'm going to go to TS's uh, draft. So she literally tried to copy and paste the template. And you could see my writing, uh, well, some of the things that I wrote, template, the meaning of my name, my name draft, right? writing move, language support, it all got out of the columns and just kind of got onto here. She was able to make sense of it enough to get paragraphs going. Um, and um, she literally took some of my language patterns, um, like I read that or I found out that, or blank means blank, and she just kind of cut and pasted her own information into it. And so it kind of, it came out looking like this, her drafting template, as opposed to having the typical columns. Um, but she did get the information out. Um, if we look at her final draft, TS's final draft, she got uh, it into paragraph form. Now, given that she did have some conferences with me as well, um, but she was able to get her writing into paragraph forms and she was able to compose four paragraphs using a lot of the academic vocabulary and shows a lot of understanding there. Um, in R as well took, and she just pasted it into a Google doc. I don't sure exactly why, but hers came out again like this, um, where you can see, um, you know, my writing here, template, meaning of the name, writing move, language support. And here she has some of her writing that she's put into um, the flexible patterns such as the origin of my name. Is it a feminine given name of English and French origin? Natalie is derived from the Latin phrase, Natalie Domini, and so on. So uh, she was able to do her research in, and get that information into, um, into some comprehensible pattern with the language patterns that we were practicing. And here, this is WR. He com- he's level three EL, again, very close to reclassification completely skipped writing on the drafting template, but let's see how he did in his his final draft. We can see that he was able to use a lot of these um, flexible patterns that I provided. I was trying to give them a structure for a segue between one of the books they read and he did say in the story blank, and he started to talk about the story, my name is Maria Sabel, and he used the phrase recently I've been researching about um, I also found out and I discovered. And so he was able to use a lot of those flexible patterns. You can see in that first paragraph and you can see that throughout the history of my name, the meaning of my name in conclusion. Um, so despite the fact that he skipped the drafting template itself, he was able to use some of those flexible patterns in this, this Google Doc that he created and turned in. Okay. So let's move on to the next slide. So what was working as I reflected upon their writing, um, I did see a lot of these flexible portable language patterns that we were, we were practicing orally in breakout rooms. Like recently I've been researching about in the story according to, and they were also in the drafting template. I did see them, a lot of those in their essays. Um, I saw that the kids were able to use a lot of the bricks that were related to research on their name, words like origin, popularity, and meaning, which was very successful, which is expanding their vocabulary and made me very happy as a teacher. Now, what are some of the other insights that I have? The delta are things to consider, and then the light bulb are some possible solutions. So many students had difficulty conceptualizing the transition, obviously, from the drafting template to a final copy in the writing process. And this, of course, was the first drafting template I'd given them all year, so they probably hadn't seen it before. So I got the idea of chunking the drafting template in steps 
to the hook, the big idea, and the introduction itself, and then separate slides for different paragraphs. I, I'm making it sort of like a smart deck of slides. Uh, the kids also, on the Delta side, the kids struggled to find their notes, um, their notes with a completely separate Google Doc, um, or sometimes the bricks. So I considered inserting hyperlinks into the drafting template that would take them back to their note page in Google Docs uh, to make reference to their notes, sources, and other docs with the bricks. So by having those hyperlinks, I thought it would help a kid um, on that to be able to go back and not have to toggle back or go back to Google Classroom and find where that was. Um, the, col the column format was also narrow going this way. It became very long, long. And so I started to consider a, a, a format, for instance, horizontal format where you had the drafting, uh, the, the flexible patterns on the left and then the drafting on the right, considered putting it in this way in a vertical format with that above and the place to write on the bottom. So now we're going to look at student work. This is after I've done several different drafting templates. I had done some in Spanish as well. But this was a, a project that we do in fourth grade on a missions report. To give you a little background about that, um, I give them four different options of reports. Um, they have a compare and contrast. They have a describe the life of, of an indigenous person who lived on the mission, a neophyte. Um, they have a biography choice, and then they also have an opinion uh, paper choice. And they, uh, I put them in breakout rooms to share their information as they're doing research. Of course, in breakout rooms, I can't be at all of them at once, and hopefully they're all on task when they're doing that. Um, some of them were better at taking notes on the note-taking page than others. And others had the option, of course, of using just their notebook. And unless they took photos, I wasn't able to see their notes. Um, one thing, of course, that's inconvenient about distance learning is you don't have that, those little mini conferences that you can have when you're just walking around the room or when you're just noticing things as they're talking in their groups and walking from group to group. I was able to pop in and out of breakout rooms and that um, serve that purpose and make one-on-one -on -one, um, appointments as necessary. So here is WS again. We're going to just look at his writing. WS again is a student that... Um, could be um, reclassified shortly because he's showing great progress in, as a reader and um, hopefully um, with showing evidence through testing as well, he and his um, taking his LPAC this year, um, he might be reclassified. So let's see how he did. Um, this is the uh, what it looked like, the, the slideshow that I created that helped the kids and kind of replace the drafting template. Um, and I am going to scroll down without going through the whole thing. I'm going to scroll down to the body paragraphs. So what I did here, um, basically I would chunk it. And so I would do short mini lessons. And then I would expose them to that poor part of the slideshow and then, you know, show them this is where you need to write this. Um, and so I have here the flexible, uh, some of the flexible uh, and portable patterns of language that they can transfer into their writing. And then um, some int more introductory kind of transitional phrases for contrasting and adding information. Um, and then on the next slide, let me go into the present mode so you can see this larger, okay. And then on the next slide, this I provide like an outline kind of a situation where they could put their topic sentences for each paragraph in each box. So he wrote his big idea at the top. In my opinion, it was not necessary for the natives to live on the mission. And his first topic paragraph, uh, topic sentence was one reason that it was not necessary for the California Indians to stay on the mission was because they were often forced to do difficult work. His second topic sentence Another reason that it was not beneficial for the natives to live on the mission was because they had to live a completely different type of lifestyle, and he did not choose to do a third paragraph. So the instructions were to have at least a three-paragraph essay, so to have at least one body paragraph, and he chose to have two, which is acceptable. Then evidence in your body paragraphs, I provided more language support here for different phrases to uh, talk about that and for providing a quote or reference to text and also interpreting quotes. Okay, so this is his draft of the body paragraphs. 
Another reason that it was not beneficial for the natives to live on the mission was because they had to live a completely different type of lifestyle. The Indian men at the missions wore loose trousers made of a coarse cloth and long uh, t shirts with V-necks or clothing was mostly all white. The women's dress were more brightly colored or full skirt, and they learned to farm and take care of animals. Now, of course, we can see right here he had a lot of facts that he probably got from his research. It didn't tell us much about why it was not beneficial. So these are kind of the kinds of things that we had to deal with when we'd have our conferences, our writers' conferences, which I tried to have with each student at least once, one-on-one, -on -one, before they had their final draft turned in. And uh, well, I'm not going to go to the trouble of reading the second one, but this one, was, he did a little better job of making a connection between his topic par sentence and his evidence in the paragraph. Then the conclusion, again, I did the same thing where I provided the flexible language here. And um, then he, for, for some reason on his conclusion, again, he was back into the language of one reason, another reason, which was something that we had to deal with with one-on-one -on -one conferences because obviously these aren't concluding phrases. But this was the conclusion. He put them together somehow, and he did start with in conclusion because um, and his, uh, it's his topic sentence. Okay, now let's go back now to our presentation. Now his final draft would be interesting to see after he had used his drafting template and after we'd had our one-on-one -on -one conferences looked like this. Um, it wasn't necessary. Now, originally I had them doing a little short narrative as their hook. It was very challenging for some. So in his case, he did not use the hook, which as a short narrative, but it still worked very well as an introduction. He um, stuck with his um, topic, I mean, with his big idea, which is obviously the thesis, but we call it big idea in fourth grade. Um, a little repetitive with this one reason, one reason. Um, here again, he added a completely different type of lifestyle, um, which gave him a reason to explain all of this about their clothing. Um, although he didn't tell us what his life, their lifestyle was like previously, um, there was a little bit more of a connection there. And then talking about the difficult tasks they had, and then um, he added uh, another paragraph to his conclusion and he reiterated those two reasons that he gave here in his final paragraph. Okay, so let's go back to our reflections. Again, pre like previously, I saw that students use some of the flexible portable language patterns, like one reason that, and in my opinion, which uh, was very good. Students were able to use a lot of the bricks related to research on the mission period in the case of W. Um, are beneficial, problematic, Spanish padres, natives, and other bricks that showed in, um, understanding of the missions period. What are some of my insights? Well, obviously in the Delta section, I found it challenging to anticipate all the language that was needed when students had four different types of essays. And I was using a, uh, you know, a template that I'd used in previous years. So reflecting on it, I probably would not have done four different types of essays, I'd probably limit them to two. Um, and then some students weren't ready to write because they hadn't done their notes. And I found that the one-on-one -on -one appointments were very time consuming. And a lot of students were doing last minute research as they were composing their essays. Um, so I thought maybe I need to make appointments sooner in the writing process. Um, taking notes with the children on Zoom in small groups, which I did with just a few students that were very much at risk. But um, I'm thinking about doing that um, in small groups in, if I have to continue this virtual um, learning again. Putting these notes on the same slideshow, or again, a hyperlink to the notes, which I did not implement in this one, um, but I think would be a great idea. Oh, okay. So uh, there's more reflections there. The um, fictional story or narrative that I initially proposed for the hook, I think was very challenging. And um, some were able to rise to that. Um, to that uh, challenge, but uh, very few, I think there was probably two of my language learners were able to master that. Um, so I think that that was probably a, too challenging for this hook. We'd use other hooks like questions um, that would help get the reader into the essay. So not all students attended class meetings in the afternoon. That's a little out of our control, but that is the case. And the drafting template was long, and I'm not sure if all the students comprehended it. They weren't all there to see my mini lessons. 
Um, so seven of my English language learners did not turn in the assignment, which to me is a big fail. And that was made me very sad. We were also under a time pressure because in the spring quarter, we ended up changing classes. So all those who were coming back in person came with me. So I lost some of those students and quickly had wasn't able to um, do some of the follow-up I would do after assignments were not turned in. So I am considering that, you know, making screencastifies for each stage of the writing process for those that didn't attend class. Again, we can't we can't guarantee that they'll go and watch those, but um, that would be a good idea to create screencastify videos like uh, think alouds for composing and revising. And then also there, there could be more references to sources and text. As I was looking over their essays, um, even though they had a checklist and that was on their checklist and we did do practice in class of quoting text, um, I found that that's a standard that we begin doing in fourth grade. It is very challenging still. So I am considering that I need to create graphic organizers for text references. And we might even be able to share those. Um, they don't have to be the kind of thing that oh, you must have found it yourself so that I can help kids be more successful at quoting text and making references to text. So I just want to encourage you, hopefully as you're seeing um, my practice, it's not perfect, um, but it's in process. And I just encourage you to keep innovating and keep reflecting so that we can best serve our language learners. And um, thank you for taking the short journey with me on reflecting about my practice.